But now the United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. In the history of the world, no nation has ever been as deeply in debt as we are, the U.S. is. There is no question that in the next few decades, especially, having a different option is very important. From Nomad Compass Live 2023 in Kuala Lumpur, where we've got every room in the house. It's a great pleasure to be joined by the original adventure capitalist, legendary investor Jim Rogers. Mr. Rogers, uh, a pleasure to be with you again. I am delighted to be here, Andrew. This has been a lot of fun. And we shared the stage last night. We had a, uh, a Q&A for all of our guests here. What I would ask you to start, you wrote uh, Investment Biker, then Adventure Capitalist, uh, for people who aren't familiar with what you did decades ago, riding all around the world on a motorcycle, tell us the story. Well, Andrew, I grew up in a very small village in the backwoods of Alabama, and I wanted to see the world. I knew there was more. I loved motorcycles, so I wanted to go around the world on a motorcycle. I remember telling a guy once like that, and he said, why don't you fly? You know, why don't you fly? I said, no, 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 motorcycles are fun, and I want to see the world close to the ground. Because if you're close to the ground, you really find out what's happening. So I guess I was a little nuts, but I wanted to go around the world on a motorcycle. It took me a long time to get permission from the Chinese, red Chinese, Soviets, what were they called in those days? Communists, uh, communist Russia. But I finally got permission, and I did it. And we were talking about all the different uh, driver's license endorsements and visas and customs checks that you must have gone through. And there were some pretty harrowing uh, experiences at some of those borders. Well, no, of course. And you had to have inoculations, too, in many places. Uh, but I didn't say it was easy, but I did say it was fun. It was complicated. I went through several war zones. And I assure you, war zones are not fun. But I'm alive. And I'm quite pleased to be alive. So uh, I first read some of your stuff. It's been 25 years from now. Obviously, a lot has changed since then. Which countries would you say have gone up? And which countries do you think have gone down since then? Well, the obvious the first answer is uh, China. China has gone up. When I first went to China, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, that was 40 years ago. It's changed dramatically. And, of course, Russia's gone down. Well, I guess, you know, Russia has changed a lot. Um, when the communists were there, there was very little, very little in Russia. Uh, there's not much more now, uh, but there, it's better. It's certainly more prosperous. It's more interesting. More things are happening in all the Soviet states, whatever, let's see, so Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Things have changed a lot in all the republics. So I would have to say the Soviet Union and China have the biggest changes. What do you think the United States, where does that factor in? We talked about the U.S. dollar and how you're holding U.S. dollars merely because we're not sure, you're not sure what the next thing is, but where does the U.S. factor in? Well, you know, when I was growing up, or even in the 80s, since that's what we're talking about, the U.S. was still a creditor nation. But now the United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Uh, in the history of the world, no nation has ever been as deeply in debt as we are, the U.S. is. And that cannot be good. I've read enough history to know that when countries get into this kind of situation, somebody's going to suffer eventually. And I guess it's a good time to be an old American. I don't have to pay all those debts, but I have two teenage children, and they're going to face many problems in their lives. And you moved to Singapore. I've described this as, as sort of a legacy, for, not only for yourself, but a legacy for your children, that they'd be able to be multilingual. They would be able to have that optionality. Talk about using internationalization as a way to benefit future generations? Well, there is no question that in the next few decades, especially, having a different option is very important. Uh, 
Maybe people don't want to leave their country where they are, and that's fine. But if you want to have a different option, you should. My children know Chinese fluently. They know English fluently. They know Asian. Now they can use chopsticks. Or they can use knives and forks. So I don't know if it's going to be good for them in 25 years, but I have tried to give them the option to be able to be anywhere in the world and the mindset. You, not only do you need the option, you need the mindset. Many people, if you go to them and say, things are going to be bad, they will say, okay, I don't care. I want to stay here. Or I'll deal with it then, as if they'll, they'll, they'll have uber prescience to know exactly when it's coming. And don't worry, it'll be okay. Right. <sighs> Many times I've heard that. Uh, but I've read enough to know that when things change, it can be extremely serious, and you better have, you better, if you're not prepared, you better at least have options to do something. So that's what I'm trying to give my children. And you mentioned that your uh, daughter, to those who say, well, how are my kids going to get fit in overseas? She just won election to the, uh, the, the student council president. Yeah, to my shock, uh, my daughter goes to a school where everybody's a Chinese, it's a girl's school, they're all Chinese. She's the only one with blue eyes in the school. Uh, but they had an election for student council president recently, and to our shock, our delight, she won. My, my wife told her not to do it because she couldn't win. Well, she did it, and she won, and she's got blue eyes. and They fit in very well there. You know, she's very, she's, something's right. She's fitting in very, very well because she is the student council president. And when they have assembly and they need a Chinese girl, she's the Chinese girl. She speaks They better. speak fluent. She speaks better Chinese than they do. So they put her on the stage, <laughs> blue-eyed kids speaking Chinese. What do you see at the overlap? Because I think adventure capitalist was an idea of investing in economies that maybe people generally don't think about. What do you see, because you mentioned having options, with adventure capitalist and nomad capitalist internationalization? How do those two come together? Well, as I said last night, I'm very impressed by what you're doing or trying to do, uh, because everybody does need to learn and know about the rest of the world and know about options. If nothing else, there are always countries rising, people rising, industries rising, and if you know about them, you might take advantage of those opportunities and you might become very successful. So I'm impressed by what you're trying to do. I hope you're doing it well. I don't know, because uh, I've done it all on my own, uh, but uh, it is an extremely good option for people to have. So second citizenship, you talked about that's important to you. It should be important for everybody. Yeah. Having a residence permit, so Singapore, perhaps a country someone can move to now, not likely to become a citizen, doesn't really allow for dual citizenship. That could be a place you live. So you're all in favor of having a passport, having a residence, banking, I think you mentioned. Well, I'm mainly interested uh, all for having an option. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't have the option, and something happens, you're stuck. Even if you want to do something, which many people won't do because of the mindset, but you would have the option. I mean, if tomorrow something dramatic happens, I think, I hope, my family and I can do something else because we have the mindset and the knowledge and the passports and the preparation, bank accounts, investments, just have the option is very important. And you hope you never need it. You hope you never, ever need it. But if you do, it's too late. You've approached this, though, as an adventure. And so while you've lived in Singapore for a long time now, if you woke up tomorrow and Singapore was no longer the friendly place, I don't see any indication why that would be the case. But if that were to happen, how would you approach this as an adventure that you need to go to one of those other places? Because I think that, that trips a lot of people up, that, hey, I want to go one place and then I'm done. Well, if you, you should have the knowledge, as I said about my children, I'm trying to give them the exposure and the knowledge of the rest of the world. 
My daughters have been to more countries than I'd heard of when I was their age. And who knows what will happen. But if something happens, at least I hope they have the mindset to say, oh my gosh, disaster is here. Now they can sit there and say, I'll figure it out. Or they can sit there and figure out, okay, what do I do now? Where do I go? How do I survive this? History is full of wars, natural disasters, economic disasters. History full of changes that could require people to change. I'm from the United States. Everybody in the United States, except for the American Indians, came from somewhere else at one time or another because somebody in their family decided there are better options elsewhere. Why don't I take advantage of it? And they hold those ancestors in high esteem. And yet somehow it's interesting that the idea of them moving is not to be held in high esteem. Never figured that one out. You are very insightful. Yes, it's amazing. I mean, I have run into people in the United States who have immigrated to the United States, and they start bad-mouthing other immigrants. I say, wait a minute, you're a foreigner, you're an immigrant. What are you talking about? And they always say, but they are different. They're yeah. different from me when I was doing it. And they say this is different. I mean, one thing you watch the politicians in the United States, the greatest country in the history, not just now, but the history of the world, as if these politicians, they've, been, they've studied 10,000 years. And I say to myself, you were talking about the rise and fall of countries. You said China's come back multiple times, but they all eventually fall. Well, historically, yes, every country, no matter who has been on top, they've all declined, except, I mean, China's declined several times and been disaster, but China, for whatever reason, is the only country that's been at the bottom and risen to the top three or four times. I don't know why yet. I'm trying to figure it out, but nobody else has done that. But wherever you are, chances are something's going to go wrong in your country eventually. And you, if it happens, you can say, I don't care. Or you can say, well, wait a minute. My great-grandfather got on a boat and went across the sea and made life better for me and my children. I should think about it. Pay it forward. Is there a, a cultural entrepreneurship in, in, let's say, China? You say they've risen multiple times. Is it something like that that's caused them to, to be resilient, in your opinion? I have been trying to figure out, Andrew, if I can, I'll get rich. You know, we all will. Uh, you can figure it out, perhaps, but I don't know what it is. You know, weather, food, water, education, whatever it is, something has happened to cause the Chinese to revive it several times. What, what do you credit Singapore for? I, I saw something recently very boldly saying it's the leadership. I think that's important. People who maybe don't live in Singapore said, well, the geography is good. What do you credit Singapore's amazing turnaround? Well, if you look at a globe, Singapore is the most important port in a, and, and therefore the world. Uh, so the location has helped dramatically, dramatically. And as you know, uh, Singapore became a country, independent country in 1965. Well, if you remember your history, that's when Asia started booming. Japan, Korea, all these places that were backwaters or disasters in the 60s and 70s and 80s had a huge boom. Asia did. So Singapore was at the right place at the right time. Now, the guy who was running Singapore did some very smart things. He insisted on bilingualism. He insisted that everybody save a huge amount of their income. And he actually took their income and made them save it and made them invest it. So if you save and you invest and you educate, especially bilingually, and you're at the right place, chances are you will be successful. Do you see some of the other countries, now there's the Singapore of this, the Singapore of that. People talk about Rwanda is the Singapore of Africa or Uruguay could be the Singapore of, of, of South America. Are there other pending Singapores that you're aware of and does any country ever come close, or is there much more fragmentation? Well, if it were that easy, Andrew, all we'd have to do is just go around and peddle, peddle the method. Um, I see good things happening in Uzbekistan now. Uzbekistan was an old Soviet republic. 
which was a disaster. The Soviets ruined it. And it was a disaster. I went there a few times. But now the people running it, back to your point about leadership, these people seem to be doing the right thing. They know what they think they know what has to be done, and they seem to be doing it. Saving, investing, all of the things that make uh, society successful. I see what's happening there. I look around the world. I see possibly good things happening in Colombia. You know, Colombia has been ravaged by civil war for decades. One of the things I have learned, if you go to a country at the, near the end of a war or a civil war, chances are you're going to make a lot of money because everything's cheap. Nobody has optimism. Nobody, nothing's expensive. And new ideas can go a long way. So finding a place at war or disaster, epidemic, whatever it is, can be a useful guideline. But back to the ones that I see, I see things happening in Colombia. I see things, I think I see things happening in Uzbekistan. Rwanda certainly has good press. I don't know how much of it is accurate or not, but it, the one time I was there, I was impressed. What, one of the things that happened that helped Rwanda a lot was, you know, after the massacre, Everybody felt guilty, and so the Western countries put a lot of money, a lot of money into Rwanda. It's got an astonishing infrastructure with all of this guilt money. I'm not saying it's bad, but it, it certainly helped them enormously. So if you can find some kind of change, positive change in a country or a society, you might have a great success. We talked uh, the other day about fewer opportunities for Americans, and I would imagine the future of the West, because oh, sanctions, some of those places that are coming out of war, whether it's Germany or Japan decades ago, wherever it may be next, perhaps there's an advantage to, to being diversified in order to make investments that someone who's American or some other Western passport holder can't. Well, if you have more than one passport, you certainly have run into opportunities that you might not otherwise. For instance, right now, I'm an American, but I mean, I have an American passport. I have other passports, but you know, investing in Ukraine is not practical for me now. Investing in Russia is not practical for me now. But I do know investing in countries at war usually leads to great opportunity. If you have, I mean, Americans are not likely to invest in Russia right now, but if you are Brazilian or something, Uruguayan, you might be able to invest in Russia and you might find good opportunities, which are closed off to people who don't have the options. And so you can make up your own mind, ethically and financially, what you want to do, rather than your country doing it for you, you're saying? I don't know if I'm very smart, but I think I'm smarter than bureaucrats in Washington. I hope I'm smarter than I, bureaucrats I so. in Washington. Uh, let's talk about China. There are folks saying demographics moving in the wrong direction. It's the last decade for China. You've been uh, very favorable towards China since the books came out, and, and I think still today. Why are those folks wrong? Well, I mean, I look back at history. China is the only country that's been successful more than once. And, but remember the U.S. Oh, my gosh. In the United States, we had huge problems. We had a horrible civil war. We had many depressions with a D. We had illegal, dishonest politicians. We've had many things. Have or had? <laughs> yes. Uh, many things have gone wrong in the United States, but for whatever reason, we overcame those problems and became very successful. That is going to happen in other countries in the future. It has happened in the past. You know, in 100 years ago, Britain was the richest, most successful country in the world. There was no number two. 50 years later, Britain went bankrupt. IMF had to fly into London and bail them out. Couldn't pay their bills. So these things happen no matter who you think you are and no matter where you think you are. Something can change and will change. So I hope that all of us learn enough history or learn enough about the world to know something is going to change and take advantage of it. 
When you say we as Americans, uh, tell me how as someone who invests in a lot of places around the world, someone who no longer lives in the United States, what is your identity and, and relationship in your mind with the United States? Well, I'm a U.S. citizen and therefore a U.S. taxpayer. Uh, unfortunately, America is one of, I think, only two countries in the world where you have to pay American taxes no matter what. Other countries don't do that. Other countries don't think that's a fair system. I don't think it's a fair system. You live system. in Singapore, you pay in Singapore, and you'd pay a lot less. Yes, and if you don't earn money in country X, you don't have to pay taxes in country X, except the U.S. Well, you don't live there, yeah, and you don't live there. Doesn't matter yep. under the American yep. system, and as I said, it's only one of two in the world that I heard of, of. So I don't consider it fair. But who cares what I think? They think it's fair in Washington, so that's the system. But other people don't have that problem. I mean, if you're Portuguese and you live in Brazil, you don't pay any taxes. Well, you you choose you choose where you want to pay, basically, rather than it being chosen for you. You do choose. You choose many things. If you live in a different place and if you have uh, multiple passports, which are perfectly legal, one good thing about the United States is you can have as many passports as you want. Nobody will stop you. There are some countries, Singapore, you can only have one passport for historic reasons. So some countries are more open and free, if you, if you use that term. Um, it depends on where you are. If, if you had to choose, would you want to be an American or would you want to be a Singaporean citizen if it, if it came down to one or the other? Well, for the reasons I mentioned before, in America I can have more than one passport. In Singapore you can only have one passport and I consider that dangerous, uh, no matter what the country, if you can only have one passport because I don't know what's going to happen in the next 50 years but I want to have the option, which having one passport could be dangerous. We talked about China, uh, and I know historically you've said perhaps Hong Kong should adopt uh, there maybe. Uh, what are your thoughts on China's currency now? And, and, and if you had to imagine a situation when the currency opened up and perhaps presented more of a more competition to the dollar, what would that take? Well, I own a lot of U.S. dollars, but I know that the era of the U.S. dollar is coming to an end. No currency stayed on top forever, no more than 100, 150 years, none in history. I can see that era of the U.S. dollar is coming to an end, but Andrew, I don't see another currency at the moment that can compete except the Chinese currency, but China, the currency is a blocked currency. You can't just buy and sell it like you can euros or dollars or something. So until China completely opens its currency, I don't see its practice. Now, they're doing it. They've been doing it for 20 years. Not enough, if you ask me. But it's the only currency that I see on the horizon that someday can compete with the U.S. dollar. I hope something else comes along, but I don't see it yet. Do you think China will take moves to be more open in that regard? Well, they have been since for 20 years. They have been opening it up, but for some reason, I mean, if I were Beijing, I'd open it today. I'd say, hello, Beijing, make it completely open today. They don't care what I think. Uh, they have been moving in that direction. There are people now who say that China's closing off again. I, maybe it is, but it's not like 50 years ago. I hope that China continues to open up. It'll be good for the world and good for China. One of our VIPs was asking about BRICS and your thoughts on that, some new countries joining this uh, alliance, let's call it. What, what, do you, what impact do you see BRICS having on the world, and, and what does it mean to you as an investor, if anything? Well, I don't pay too much attention to BRICS. BRICS is some artificial, you know, for the guy in Wall Street who looked at a map and said, oh, look at those Give big it a countries. Name. He'd never been to most of them. In fact, he'd only been to one. He didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. He just looked at a map. Since it was, he was at Goldman Sachs, they all listened to him. They wrote it down and listened to him. But even now, BRICS, in my estimation, is nothing more than a figment of somebody's imagination. It's, they say they're expanding, but they're not expanding anything more than just annual meetings. 
that I can see. There's nothing behind the concept. They're all wonderful countries, and they're going to be, can have been, and will be successful countries, but I don't see. And you know, Andrew, as I look at history, there have been very few, if any, alliances of countries that have lasted very long. Particularly in so many different parts of the world. I mean, from Brazil to China to, I mean, it's, that's very disparate. Well said. Well put. Yes, that makes it even more improbable, if you ask me. China and India, there's been comparisons between those two. Uh, you speak very favorably of China. What, thoughts on India as an investor? Well, first of all, if you can only visit one country in your life, I would say you go to India. I mean, there's no, the man-made sites, the natural sites, the food, the languages, the religion, everything. You walk down the street in India and it's a constant sensory feast. You sit there and say, look at that. And the women are always winning the beauty contest. I mean, it's an amazing place. But the Indians learned bureaucracy from the English and then they took it to a higher plane. The Indians are very good at many things. Uh, it's, they're great success stories in India and coming out of India. But I don't quite see it, partly because there are so many languages and ethnic groups and linguistic groups that, yes, there's, there is success and there will be more successes coming out of India. But I don't see it anytime soon. It's getting better at the moment, but so are many other places. I don't see India becoming the next China yet. Maybe it will, but I don't see it. A country I've heard you talked about before you came here, you've spoken about it. We've looked at it for the past couple of years uh, because it's a region that we look at, Uzbekistan. Uh, what are they doing that makes you very interested? Because I think a lot of people, most people in the West haven't heard of Uzbekistan, but in post-Soviet countries, Georgia, those companies are really piling in. Well, Uzbekistan, uh, on a map, it's, it's got a good geographic location. It's right near China, India, Russia, many other places. They have a lot of natural resources, agriculture, metal, many things are there. It's a big country, so they have a lot of natural resources. They have some of the most amazing tourist sites I have ever seen. I have only been there three or four times, but it is astonishing. that I, I suspect it's going to be a tourist mecca eventually because there are so many amazing sites there. Tamerlane, for those of you who may not remember, Tamerlane was one of the world's great conquerors a few hundred years ago. He was from Uzbekistan, uh, but he built a lot of good stuff. Many other people did too. So I see tourism, natural resources, lots of things. The, the location is geographically very good for trade and commerce with important countries in the world. And if you have the right people saying, Let's open up. Let's get investors here. Let's do things. It could be very successful. What about Colombia stands out to you? Colombia is an, another country, you know, had this long civil war, drug war, civil war, every problem. And it is a country with a lot of natural resources, a lot of smart people, and it is changing. Apparently, the war is, has ended, uh, we think. Uh, and Colombia has enormous possibilities. Is that because of geography, because of something else? Well, I would say the natural resources, they've got oil, they've got agriculture, they've got marijuana, they have everything you want. Marijuana is legal in much of the world now. Uh, so a lot of the problems that they had, they don't have now. And the location right there, top of South America, close to the United States, could be useful. Others here in Southeast Asia were in Kuala Lumpur, Indonesia, Cambodia, Vietnam have been uh, talked about. Any of those interest you? Well, you know, Indonesia is the largest country. I mean, it's got over, over 300 million people. It's a very large country. And in recent months, recent years, I have noticed that something is changing in Indonesia. It's not now just a closed off whatever, closed off country. They seem to be opening up. They seem to be trying to attract investors. And so I am interested in Indonesia now for the 
first, one of the few times in my life, yes, I see good things. Vietnam, the same thing. There are 90 million people in a country with education, more or less one language, you know, many ethnic, they don't have the ethnic strife that some countries have that holds people back. And it's right on the Chinese border. They're not at war anymore with China. So I see good possibilities. In fact, the ones you mentioned, yes, I've opened an account in Cambodia recently. I haven't bought anything yet, but it's just a tiny country. So it could be useful in the future. No, there are many countries in Asia. North Korea, I wish I could invest in North Korea. I cannot because it's illegal for Americans. But I see positive changes coming there. Um, there are many places in, in Asia. You're less excited about India, but does population play a role? And to, to what extent in terms of, you're saying Indonesia, Vietnam, larger populations, does that make it more interesting? Well, it's, it's an interesting part of the mix. That in and of itself does not make it more interesting. But if you are Vietnam and you do have 90 million people, it gives you manufacturing scale, if you want it, market scale, if you want. So yes, it could be a positive factor. It can be a negative factor. You know, for a long time, the Chinese thought that having too many people was negative. They made people that couldn't have children. They limited the number of children because Mao, Mao Zedong thought that too many children was a problem. Uh, so it can go either way. You wrote the book Hot Commodities, thoughts on commodities in today's market. I know we're not doing hot tips. We'll, we'll talk on that in a minute, but thoughts on where are hot commodities today? Well, as I look around the world, most stock markets are at or near all-time highs, which doesn't turn me on. Most bond markets are in a bubble. Interest rates are, have been the lowest in recorded history in much of the world. So as I have property in many places as a bubble, if you go to New Zealand, Korea, many places, property is a bubble. But the only, the cheapest asset class I know are commodities. I mean, sugar's down over 60% from its all-time high. Silver's down over 60% from its all-time high. These are not bubble numbers when you talk about being down massive percentage points. So I think I see good opportunities going forward in commodities. And before you ask, I will say agriculture is very cheap uh, historically. Agriculture has been a disaster for a long time. The average age of farmers in America is 58. The average age of farmers in Japan is 66. I mean, I can go on. The highest rate of suicide in the UK is agriculture. You know, agriculture has been a disaster for most people for a long time. And that's happened throughout history. You go back and you read the Russian novels about how rich the agriculture barons were once upon a time. True of many countries, but we've had periods when agriculture has been a disaster in, the area, in history, but that often changes and I suspect it's changing again. Yes. Which is one last one. More people in America study public relations than study agriculture. Yeah. Nobody wants to be a farmer. I, I've seen isolated incidents, I, I think in Italy, for example, some uh, students from urban areas said, there aren't that many jobs here. That's a challenge in parts of Southern Europe. And they're actually going back. Do you see any other examples of that? Or you really think that it's an opportunity to get in? Well, I know it's an opportunity. Yeah. It's not for me. I don't want to go out and get hot and dirty every day. You know, I'm too lazy. But for many people who like being in the sun and working with their hands or working with growing things, I mean, as I said, look at history. There have been times when the agricultural people have been wildly successful and wildly rich. So I know it's an opportunity. It's not for me. I mean, I do invest in agriculture now, but it depends. Everybody has to figure out what they love the best for, for their own future. Lastly, we discussed uh, yesterday evening your opposition to hot tips. Obviously, what, what you might know, even if you wanted to tell somebody, they don't have the full picture. They don't know when to buy or when to sell. Uh, but you talked about a good investor wants things to be boring. What are your uh, suggestions for becoming a good investor? The best way is to 
stay with what you know. Everybody watching this knows a lot about something, whether it's cars or sports or fashion, something. And every day you read about it, whatever it is. I mean, I don't know anything about fashion, don't care. But there are people watching this who love fashion, who can name many things. And those are the people that can be the good investors because they will see something change. They will see something change, certainly before I will or before Wall Street will. And if you see something changing that you know is going to work, because you know a lot about it and pay a lot of attention, do your research, do your homework, and invest. And then call me. <laughs> call me give, and tell give me. Him, send him the hot tips. I, yeah, just tell me about it. I'm not going to do it because of your hot tip, but at least I might start trying to You'll learn. You'll look into it. The same way you look into all these countries, all over the map. Well, I have learned that if you do your research, chances are you'll be successful. Don't worry, I make plenty of mistakes, but I make fewer mistakes when I've done a lot of research than when I've done nothing. And you've said there's always an opportunity to make money pretty much everywhere. Well, there's always some place and somebody rising, and there's always somebody going into decline. That's a simple life. That's history. That's the world. Mr. Rogers, it's uh, been a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, Andrew, if you only knew, this has been such a pleasure for me. And I will say again, this is such a good idea, such a good idea to teach people about the opportunities in the world. So I hope you're doing a good job, and I hope you keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.